Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Roka Report podcast in association with the Sun and Commuter Soup Kitchen. It's Gav. You join us on the Battersons nil-nil draw with Bristol City at the Stadium of Light. It wasn't, uh, well, it wasn't very exciting for the most part, but there was still some stuff to talk about. There's also been a bit of manager rumours circling this week and we've got Leeds on Tuesday. So as I just said to Martin before we started recording, I think we'll find something to talk about today, won't we Martin? Hey, mate. I'm sure we do. We uh, we always do, don't we? Yeah, yeah, there's plenty to talk about when it comes to Sunderland, as this club is batshit mental and crazy. <laughs> Obviously, as well this week, Steve Davison tended his resignation, didn't he? So there's that as well. well we might yeah, talk about that so, as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. but the game, Bristol City, was... I said it, there wasn't much to talk about. I actually came away from the ground feeling fairly content. I know Mike Dodds, I listened to his interview just before we started, and I know he was a bit disappointed because he, he feels like we did enough to win and we should have won. But coming away from the ground, I was I was pretty content with the performance. I thought, considering how bad we were on Monday, this was like really important just to just to put in a, a shift where you you think, oh well, at least I try, you know. Because the other day it didn't feel like they were trying at all, and I think I came across when Mike Dodds did his post match interviews and he completely threw the players under the bus for that performance. Um, so it was important that we at least looked up for it because Bristol City are like us; they've got nothing to play for, and. Normally these games have got a bit of a drab feel about them. And to be honest, at times, I I, I turned my mate during the game and I was like, this feels like the last home game of the season when there's no to play for. It just had that kind of atmosphere about the place and people weren't really into it. Like when we were coming close with chances, people weren't getting really emotionally into it and things like that. It just felt like exactly what it was. It felt like a, a nothing game, really. But there had to be a response, didn't there, in terms of just the effort levels compared to Monday. I thought in the first half we actually played well. We really kind of took that challenge from mm. Monday on, and like yeah. as I say, we were absolutely shite on Monday. And <laughs> you know, you could accuse pretty much every player who certainly was starters of you know lack of anything on on Monday. Yeah. But I thought you know after a little bit of a nervous start against Bristol City, I thought our first half was actually pretty good. And I think if you if you kind of take the game in isolation, like the second half we completely fell off and. It was almost like, as I say, it was almost like they had the bloody flip flops on waiting to go on to the <laughs> beach, wasn't it? But if you take the game in isolation, it's one of those games where you go, I we should have won that. We had, what, 20, 20 shots, I think. They keep made some decent saves. I don't think yeah. he made any, like, any saves you wouldn't expect him to make. I think, I think the one from the Oshish oh, header, which he tipped on the bar, was good because it was, he had to think quick, but yeah, yeah, he it's did. coming out of his head. It's above you his know head. what I mean? There wasn't any, yeah. any like flying across the goal in the top corner and pulling off ridiculous. Mm. Saves are all fairly routine saves, but it's one of those games. If if we hadn't had the the results that we'd had previously, you'd kind of go, ah, oh, that's, that's a point. We should have got three. Nine, 95 times out of hundred, we'd have won that game. Mm-hmm. But I think you know it, it was a, a bit disappointing in terms of the second half performance because we we're coming off the back of such a crap run. Yeah, in that second half, you just want to see a bit more spark, a bit more effort, a bit more determination, really. Yeah, and. You know, I think Mike Dodd said he was pleased with the ball retention, how we played in possession, all that sort of stuff. I would actually sort of kind of challenge that a bit because I thought in possession we played it safe a lot of the time and we didn't try to switch. We didn't try to play it into space. We played a lot of feet. Yeah. But there was a few times where we could have sprung Joe Bellingham up front, we could have sprung Jack Clark, and we, we were playing it safe. And I think, you know, that's probably symptomatic of coming off the back of that game against Blackburn on Monday. But yeah, in the second half, it was kind of, it was strange. I don't know why we kind of went into our shell in the second half after such a good first half. But it's it's just a funny situation. You know, you and Craig touched upon it in the podcast after Blackburn, but we kind of almost wrote the season off after Beal left by putting Dodds in for the rest of the season. And I was looking back earlier and thinking, well, when, when was the last time we actually had a relatively meaningless game in early April? Because like, our seasons normally go down the wire, don't they? Yeah, There's yeah. normally mm-hmm. something to play for in the last two or three games. And, I reckon it was maybe that season that Martin O'Neill took over from Steve Bruce, like in terms of like not having anything to play for. Yeah, yeah. So like as a club and as a fan base, we're not used to mm-hmm. this sort of last seven, eight games of the season where we haven't got a great deal to go for. Yeah, it's and it's a funny situation to be in, isn't it? Because Very, it, it just felt like, as you say, it felt like the last game of the season, did. and it's not. But it, it's just kind of seeing the season out and, until we start again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and and well, I've been saying it for weeks. I just wish the season would end. It's just <laughs> that that on Monday was the biggest like I wish the season would end now <laughs> moment of the season yeah. to date because it was just 
you're just watching them. And like one thing I've never really done with this group of players is accuse them of a lack of effort. But it was it was a lack of effort on Monday. Like they just weren't up for it. They couldn't be asked. That was evident. Second half yesterday, I think when you look at we were trying to introduce players who've been injured. Like obviously Clark's been out a long time. We brought on Adji Alisi, we brought on Patrick Roberts, which is all good stuff because like they're, they're important players. But they're important players who've got nothing to play for. So it's like if you're like Patrick Roberts on Monday, he shouldn't have started the game. No. Nah. That was a more effective use of him yesterday when he was coming on for the last what 15, 20 minutes to run at some tiring legs. Like that's that's a much more effective use of Patrick Roberts when especially when he's had such a long time out. And then, you know, you look around the pitch and Hilda started. I just don't get it with him. Like I, I don't think he's good enough for Sunderland at all. I don't think he ever will be. And I'm and I feel a bit harsh writing him off because he's only a young boy. But I can't even see the raw materials there with him. I can see it with other players like Elise and Seal, but I just don't see it with Leo Hielder. But he starts the game. He comes in. Chris Rigg came back into the team, which I think a lot of people were upset he didn't play on Monday. So it was good to see him starting another game. Um, and obviously Jack Clark starting as well. So the, the team selection, if you look at it. I think was pretty rudimentary. I, I would probably start at Adji Elise. I, I know maybe that they're trying to they're trying to hold him back a bit, but he played by all accounts played ninety minutes on Wednesday in a friendly under twenty ones game, wasn't it? I think or a combination yeah. team, something like that. He's been playing for the under twenty ones in recent weeks. He's had friendlies behind closed doors and stuff. So I, I don't know. I would I would have started Elise, but I kind of to a degree like we were having this debate in the pub before the game. Like why is he not starting? And I I brought up um, when Niall Huggins got himself back fit last year he was fit from sort of January onwards but the club were like no you've been out too long we're not going to rush anything here you you know you'll play the odd 21s game pre-season is where we want you to come back into the fold and like it, it was a freak injury he got but up until that point he was you know it did you could tell it had benefited him maybe not mentally because you know a footballer wants to get back on the pitch but yeah for Niall Huggins it was beneficial because that meant he had a proper lead up he had a proper pre-season like the rest of the team so I would have liked to have seen Agilise start, but I kind of do understand it. But then I'm looking at the rest of the, the squad that we had available. Barr wasn't in the squad, and I don't know if that was explained away. But it was it would be a bit strange for him not to be on the bench, wouldn't it? I don't know whether he was injured or not. No, he wasn't injured. He just wasn't wasn't chosen. Crack as that, because he's, he's been starting games recently. It is when you've got Burstow on the bench. Well, do you reckon there's something gone on there? Because that's, that's odd. Dodds just said he, he, wasn't, he wasn't picked and he had to earn his place back in the side. But I, I just think... As I say, with if you've got Burst on the bench, you're pretty much saying we haven't got any other players to pick because like, mm. it's useless having Burst on the bench. I would rather have had Watson on the bench and yeah. give him 20 minutes after Clark tired because he, he did tire. But like you know, Jack Clark come back in the side and Roberts and Elise from the bench, like you just saw the quality that we've been missing. Yeah, mm-hmm. like it, it was um, like it was such a a clear thing to see when like because Jack Clark on the ball he's just a level above everything else we've got but he inspires the other players like he drags defenders towards him so he creates space for other players to play in and like the other players look more confident when they get the ball when Clark's making runs and darting around and I think you you know you put Monday's game to one side to to some extent because that that was just a a complete calamity wasn't it it was a complete disaster from start yeah. to finish but you take players like Jack Clark you saw the difference direct comparison between Hielder and Elise and Elise immediately just looked streets above Hielder in every single aspect of life not just football so <laughs> like Elise just looked class when he came on Roberts he's had a poor season really by his his standards and he hasn't been hitting top form near anywhere as much as we like him but even when he gets the ball you see him He's got quality, and he hasn't yeah. shown it throughout. But you know, there was one, yeah, he, their their left back got booked, didn't he? Pretty much soon after Roberts came on for for bringing him down. And I would have actually liked to have seen Rig stay on and go in, in centrally behind Job, because I would like to see yeah, Rig get a, a more central sort of run there. We've had a question about that on Twitter from, let me see, uh, I should have had this ready, but we I'm sure we've had a question about this from somebody on, preparation, on from yeah pre- horrible preparation from me. I'm sure we've had a question <laughs> about Rig, but yeah, a lot of people asking would we like to see him play in his proper position, which is more central? Because that's been a bit strange, hasn't yeah. it, seeing Rig play on the right? I don't get it. It kind of it's kind of like in possession, Hume assumes the sort of wide role on the right hand side, and and Rig tucks in. But I don't know. I, I feel like what it's doing is it's not getting Rig involved in the game as much. 
Like he's great on the ball when he's central. He gets on. Like you, do, no, you don't know he's sixteen year old when he's on the ball because he gets involved. No. And when he's on the right, right, it just feels like he's being kind of put to one side. I think I think it's probably a combination of um, like the other players who we have available. And I think look, Aushish has come back into the team, and he, he had like a calamitous like five minutes, didn't he, in the first half where every yeah. pass he misplaced. And I don't know what <laughs> what he was what was going on there with him, but apart from that, he, you know, he kind of comes in and out of the game. And sometimes he looks really good, and other times he he, he didn't um, against Bristol City. But like I think he I think they see a lot of potential in him. And I think he he's got a lot of potential. He you was know, track records and his you know his his appearances for. France at youth team level and all that sort of stuff, and he's got hundred plus appearances professionally in France, hasn't he? Before he came came to yeah, yeah. so I think they see a lot of potential in him for next season, and they're kind of wanting to give him a, a chance in the team between now and the end of the season, and that's kind of the interesting thing between now and you know, the, well, in the last five or six games that we've got, because you know you, you said earlier that you know there's not, not a great deal to play for, but there's actually for each like individuals, there's tons to play for, isn't there? Because I think you know there's question marks about certain players who we might have thought were ready to come into the team a bit more next season, who probably aren't. There's been some question marks, you know, in in, in Clark's absence. You kind of go, well, nobody's really grasped that opportunity to show. All right, I'm ready to step in for him full time if he does go in the summer. So there's all that potential there to to sort of realise for a few players. But like, I would like to see Rig centrally, but it's like, where who do you put him in for? Because if they see Aushish as a, a starter next season, which I think they're probably hoping he, he will be, where does Rig fit? Does he play alongside Dan Neal in the centre? That would be a potential. But then obviously Equa comes out with that. And I think, you know, I think everybody can see that we need more experience in the centre midfield. And I think we, we'd be targeting that for next season. So really that number 10 role is probably where Rig has the best chance of, of getting in. Now, I, I would love to see him play there. I think him playing on the right, as you say, I th- like, Yesterday, Hume was bombing forward and like he held it, was kind of pushing across the back, wasn't he? So it was almost three at the back at times. And Hume was trying to get up that, that space, but it kind of it limits Rig somewhat, doesn't it? Because he doesn't get on the ball as much as he would do if he was, if he was playing in the centre. Yeah, and he, and he doesn't give you any width because I don't think he's a winger. No, he's trying but he cuts best, it, but he's, he's left footers, doesn't he? Yeah. So he, he's gonna, every time he gets the ball, he's going to be 10 yards inside the pitch and he's always going to turn inside onto his left foot. Now, whether they think him playing there, he can have a touch onto his left foot, have a shot, because we, we've seen he can he can have a shot from range. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's, there's part of that. But, you know, even when, I know Roberts is, is left footed and Clark's right foot, they play on the opposite sides, but they do hug the touchline and drive in from the touchline. But Rig holds the position 10 yards in field and then goes inside from, from that. So it's almost like giving him a space in the side because we want to play him. But we haven't got his position available, so he's kind of fitting in elsewhere. Yeah. It doesn't seem quite a natural thing for us to do. Or maybe they think they don't want to give him the responsibility of playing in the centre. I don't know. But I would love to see him play in that number 10 role for a couple of games before the end of the season. Like, Yeah, same, same. And I think his long-term future will be as a central attacking midfield player. Oh, you can There's see no a mile off, that. can't you? Yeah, I just, I just think maybe at the minute it's a bit, it all feeds into the sort of the conversation we've been having actually about how, you know, the, the rest of the season's maybe a chance for them to try these things. And it's just maybe with rig, getting them on the pitch. So, you know. Oh, but you know what, Gav, as well, like the other thing with rig, I think I'm correct in saying he, he hasn't signed a professional contract yet, has he? And he can't do away, so no, no. until, until he's, until the summer, I think. Yeah. So, you know, we've, you know, obviously made all promises to him to get him to stay this season. And that presumably will have involved, you'll be given a chance in the first team. You'll be given first team minutes, you'll be given exposure, you'll be de- developed. And up until the last few weeks, he hasn't really been given a sniff. So, you know, there's, there's probably part of it where they're thinking, oh, shit, we need to get him on the field and give him some football. Yeah. So we've kind of ticked our box in, in terms of the, the conversations that we've had to yeah. get him to to stay because, you know, we, you know, as, as a club and as a fan, bit, like, we want him to sign a four or five year contract and spend the next two or three years here. Like he's going to be a star. Like if he's handled correctly and he stays free from injury and he looks after himself, all that sort of stuff, he's got all the hallmarks of being a top, top player at the Premier League level and above. I think you can kind of see it a mile off. A kid who's that young coming in and not looking out of place in the championship, he's going to have it made. Yeah. 
he's going to be looking at and go, well, where's best for me to progress my career? And, you know, we've got Job, who we've given an awful lot of football to. And, you know, I, I don't disagree with the amount of football. That we, I think we should have been left out on, on occasion. But generally, I don't necessarily disagree with the amount of football we've given him because he is a good player and you can see he has got potential as well. But Riggs, what, two years younger, 18 months younger than Job? He's not. Yeah. Loads younger than, than Job. Rig will be looking at it and going, well, I haven't had that much of a sniff really compared to what I thought I might get, which is why I think we were kind of giving them that, that exposure now because we, we kind of have to. Yeah. Rob Ellison Davidson on Twitter has asked us about Rig. He said, how important is it that we get Riggy tied down to a long-term contract in the summer for the first team, but also sell-on value? And you, you touched on it there. Massive. You know, where, we, where we're looking at maybe wanting to keep them around for next two or three years. I'd I'd heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I'd heard when he signed his scholarship last year that they'd also agreed along that contract, but I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, we haven't certainly haven't heard anything official on that. And I think if you're the club, they've had this kid since he was probably six or seven-year-old. They know exactly what Chris Riggs capable of. But for Chris Riggs and for his family and the people he gets advice from, I do think you've got to look at it from the perspective of you're getting an opportunity here you wouldn't get at a club this size further up the pyramid. A 16-year-old Chris Rigg I don't think gets into the first team of a Premier League team right now. Not, well, not because that, of his ability like... or anything, but I, don't, I, just think, I just think it's the way the club's built at the minute is that he will get a chance next season. He could have another four years at Sunderland and leave a 20-year-old. Do you know what I mean? It's not like he's into his 20s and having to consider his options. I think this is the best place for him, but I would say that as a Sunderland fan, you know what I mean? But Of course, I completely agree with you. But like, you're looking at his game time and where he, he plays, and we, we've talked about it, haven't we? I, like, ideally, you'd play him more centrally. Now, really, the way that we play, and the way that we'll probably play next season, there's three central positions to take. Dan Neal's going to have one of those, if he's here, you'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. We've talked about the need for experience, and I think we will be bringing in a more experienced central midfield player to play alongside somebody. So then you've got the number 10 spot. And we've talked about Oshish. We've talked about, you know, Barr was missing yesterday. He's been given chances there. Bellingham's played a lot there. You know, if we, we've got to bring in a centre forward in the summer who's first choice and playing every week. So Bellingham's going to be displaced from that team yesterday. So where does he go? So it's easy for us to go, yeah, we'll keep Reagan and play him every week and give him the chances. But unless we can kind of go, well, he fits in there and we're going to build that bit of the side around because I think we should. But like you say about, um, you know, Premier League clubs, you know, him not getting a chance or as much of a chance potentially, we all, we all know that his family's uh, black and white supporters, aren't they? Yeah. I think, is it, is it Miley, who, who's a 17-year-old who's been playing for them this season? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, not wanting to, to go down that road too much, like, but if... Newcastle are talking to him, go, look, Miley's 17-year-old, he's played 20 games a season, that's what you'll play next season for us in the Premier League. Yeah, for us, in the Championship. It's not a we've, stretch, I know, I know what you're saying, yeah. You know, he's got to be starting 25, 30 games for us next season, if we've got a chance of keeping him for any period of time. Mm-hmm. But with you know Dan Neal, with some more experience in centre midfield, with Oshish, with Bellingham, it's going to be a tough call, isn't it, where he actually fits in? Yeah, it, it's a good point. You mentioned Bellingham there. And this is a one to throw out there, I guess. It's, I was thinking about this recently. Why have they chosen to make Joe Bellingham such an important part of this team, like, quickly? And I do wonder if they're trying to capitalise on him a bit. And I don't... Oh, massively. He might not be here in the summer because clubs are going to want him. They're going to see the name. They're going to see how many games he's played. They're going to look at him, the amount of goals he's scored for a player his age. He's going to have teams wanting to buy him in the summer. And I wonder if this has been a thing where it's like a, you know, a quick sign and make a quick, he's he he out of that team. If you look, he's one player where you could make a lot of money very quickly. Like we signed him a year ago, and I reckon there'd be a team out there prepared to pay twenty for him. Like I guarantee it. And it's it's one of them. If they, if they maybe if they looked at Job and thought this is the way we've got to handle it because he's going to be valuable very quickly based on who he is and how quickly he's sort of progressed. And I know I know a lot of our fans think, you know, he's, he's in, inconsistent. He is because he's a child. You know, he's he's 18-year-old. But that's what I've been... I've, I've, that's been bouncing around my head quite a lot recently. It's like, I wouldn't be surprised if he's gone in the summer 
And then if that does happen... Solskjaer was talking, wasn't he, about when he was at Man United and tried to sign Jude Bellingham. And Jude Bellingham's representatives, I think his family are involved in in his career and all that sort of yeah, yeah. career management stuff, aren't they? And it was basically like, we, you need to guarantee him X amount of games. And he was 17, 18, whatever he, he was. And man, you couldn't guarantee him that at that point. So he went elsewhere. He went to Bristol Dortmund. And you wouldn't be like, I think it's fairly obvious, you know, putting two and two together and hopefully getting four, that the same thing's happened with, with Job. We've gone, right, we'll give you this amount of football. It's going to be more than you're going to get at Birmingham. You're away from the, the club that you've grown up at. You're away from the club that your brother plays for. You can carve your own reputation out here. And, you know, I, I think he's done really well. Is it? He's a top scorer. He was 18 or under. Yeah, I think, the, yeah. I, I, I don't know the, the exact stat, stat that, but I'd there? seen something. It's like, yeah, he's the top scorer under the age of 20, I think, or something like that. So, you know, look, I, I think his, his name's obviously going to grab attention of, of other clubs and all that sort of stuff, isn't he? But... I think his performances and his, his output deserve that attention because I think he has done well. Mm-hmm. And to be fair to him, he's been you know, he's been shoved in a few different positions, hasn't he? He's, he's played centre forward, he's played just behind the forward, right. he's played in midfield. He hasn't had a forward to play off for the vast majority yeah. of the season. He, he came out after um, Card. He came out after Cardiff and basically said, "I don't know what my position is," because yeah, he was asked I'm about it, asked. wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, I'm not asked. Um, but. I think you're right, but I think the same thing applies to pretty much every player. If we get an offer that is significantly higher than what we paid for them, and you know we can replace that player for less than that that money, we'll take it. So I, I think you know if we got offers 15, 18 million for for Joe Bellingham in the summer, he's gone. And I think it would probably yeah. be the right call at this point to do that because we're not going to be chucking a load of money in without bringing it in from player sales, are we? So to strengthen the squad overall, we are going to have to move some players on to bring that money in to reinvest. And personally, like, you know, you'd love to keep Rig and Bellingham and, you know, have a, a team that, that features both of them. But if, if push came to shove and we had to sell one of them, I would much rather sell Job than sell Rig. Yeah. I'd rather keep Rig here for the next three or four seasons because I think he's got a higher ceiling than, than Job potentially has. So it'll be interesting to see, but I think you're, you're right. I think, you know, it's been clubs linked, hasn't it? There's been, I think, Turkish clubs in. I think Spanish clubs have been in. Italian, uh, Italian, Lazio, Napoli. Yeah. Maybe. I'm not, I'm so, not sure. So, you know, there's people obviously watching them and they yeah. will have been attracted by his, his name. And, you know, for, for clubs who've got a, a decent amount of money to take a 15 million, 20 million punt on, on him at the minute is probably a good gamble to take, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I see. I think, I think that might be figured into the thinking when we sign them is that we can sort of piggyback on his brother a little bit. With the name, I mean, you look at him physically; he looks just like his brother. He's a lot younger, well, let's say two or three years younger, but he's physically looks very similar, similar style of play. I think he's, he's good. I think he's a really good player. Yeah, I think he's got a ton of potential. Yeah, but but like I say, then you factor in his durability. He's basically played every game this season, scored a few goals. Teams looking at that will look at Bellingham and think he's worth a goal, and. Like I say, it's just, I might be wrong. It's just something that's been rattling around in my head recently is that this whole, when everyone keeps saying why they keep playing Bellingham, why they keep playing Bellingham, it's probably because we want to sell him very quickly. And we, we, we look at him and we go, we can make, we, we paid maybe two or three million for him last summer. We can make 18 million on that. Quickly. Yeah, it's, it's a funny one. I'm not sure whether that's the primary motivator for playing him. I think it's up there. the whole thing will yeah. be that we promised him a certain amount of games. We want him to, yeah. to develop. And I'm I'm sure everybody would you know the ideal scenario would be that we go up this season or next season, he plays a, a key role in that, and he's a Premier League player with us. Now I, I don't have any illusions that Job was thinking I'm going to spend the next forty and fifteen years of my career at Sunderland when he signed <laughs> for us, and I don't think we ever thought that would be the case either. But you know, the second or third thing down the list would be that if we do this right, pretty quickly he's going to be worth an awful lot of money. And clubs are going to want them, and you're, yeah. you're right. We might see that sooner than we than we thought. Like I say, that we've, we've kind of gone totally away from the game here. But we were talking about the team selection and the the reason for for Craig Ma- Craig Craig <laughs> Chris Rig. <laughs> the I'm looking at it, it's Craig. got C Rig. I've just got I've, yeah, Craig. That can be his new name. Um, yeah, Craig starting, uh, but also Pierre Equa. I thought his performance was pretty good because he he's been so hit he missed recently, and um, you yeah. were talking about. Oh, sheesh, the sort of first five, ten minutes not getting anything right. 
putting things out play every time he touched the ball, pretty much. With Eckwear, it felt the opposite. It felt like every time he went up for a duel, he was coming out with the ball. Every time he passed it, he was he was playing good passes and finding space for for the rest of the team. That's more like it, isn't it, from Eckwear? But I, I've I've seen a lot of criticism from this week because I think people are getting a little bit tired of just how inconsistent he is, and you do forget how young he is. But at a point, you've got to look at him and go, "Come on, you've played a lot of football now. You're 22 year old. Like you need to start being more consistent with your performances. Yeah. Physically, I, I said this to me mate yesterday. I was like, you look at him. He should be an absolute beast in the middle of the park. He should be dominating the the, the center of the park, like in yeah. the way we used to see Jan and Via maybe do it for us, where like at times he would just hold the middle of the pitch. You look at Egwa and you look physically, he should be able to do that. He's six foot two, six foot three, pretty wide. He is strong and he's got a lovely range of passing on him and he can score goals. But yeah. I think the defensive side of his game is really lacking and that's what lets him down. And we need to see, right, okay, this has been like his first big season. He's been a consistent player this season, kind of broke in late last year. I think next year we need to see a more consistent Pierre Ekwa, but this performance was a lot more like it, wasn't it? I thought he was brilliant. Yeah. Against Bristol City, I thought. He he showed an awful lot of stuff he hasn't actually shown a great deal this season. He was sharp. You know, often when he, he's on the ball, he looks a little bit ponderous sometimes. He's not sure what to do with it. I thought he looked really sharp. He, he was aggressive. He was getting stuck into tackles. And, you know, even at the end of the game, he was... He was getting it, like, into people's faces and stuck into people, and ah, he had a bit of a he had a bit of a ding dong with one of their players, didn't he? He did, yeah. and like we haven't seen that before. He's normally relaxed and smiling and mm. almost a little bit lackadaisical. But it's funny, like, I was thinking before the match, I was kind of thinking about the, the midfield for next season. You know what? What do we actually do? Because you know you've got Dan Neal there, who I think has, has carried the midfield for a lot of the season because he hasn't had a great deal to rely upon or play with. Equa. I think has had a really poor season. And it's not just he's been inconsistent from game to game. He's been terribly inconsistent within games. And he's struggled. This, he's actually struggled to stitch together a 45-minute performance, never mind a 90-minute a performance. And I was kind of thinking to myself yesterday, like, I actually like the idea of Pierre Equa more than I like Pierre Equa. Like, I like the idea of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, all, you, know, you rattled off the good bits there. And you're right, he's, he's got all of those things. But we we hardly ever see all of those things together in one game hmm. or consistently for, uh, say, even for 45 minutes, let alone 90. But I thought yesterday against Bristol City was probably his best game since we played Southampton at home. I thought he was he was superb. He was nicking the ball. He, he, there was a few times where he got the ball and he just had a, a lovely little touch to get himself some space or get ahead of the, the player he tackled. And that's much more like it. But that's the sort of performance that coming off the back of his run last season, I was expecting to see pretty much every week. And we need to see that th- like for the rest of the season, for, to me, for him to get a regular spot for next season. Yeah. Because yeah. we cannot afford for him to have a season next season like he's had this season. Because we've, you know, with the best will in the world, and I think on his day, he's great and he seems a really good fella, good person for the club, all that sort of stuff. But he's been carried through yeah. a lot of the season by Dan Neal. And like we've suffered for it, so he like he we need to see that performance or even better than that for the rest of the season for me, for him to go. I deserve a starting place next season because at the minute, I don't think he does. I mean, maybe it's been the lack of competition in that part of the pitch because there there hasn't been much. Of... It's an easy excuse, though, isn't it? Yeah. It's like if he he's twenty two year old, he's playing his first full season of pro football, really. I know it's easy to say, isn't it? It's easy for us to sit here and say he should be up for it every game, but he should be up for it every game. Yeah. And, you know, he has yeah, he hasn't had any competition. He hasn't had anybody who can come in for him and sit out a couple of games, have a rest. And, you know, that's been a failing of, of the club in, in terms of his transfer policy. But we needed to see more from Equa this season. And he showed yesterday, on his day, he can be our star midfield player. And like he should be playing further up. Like, I think we've played him too far back a lot of the time. He says, you know, defensively he's not great, but we shouldn't be putting him in the, in the position where he's tested out defensively that much. Mm-hmm. I think he needs to play alongside somebody who is going to sort of sweep up behind him to some extent. But like, I, I thought, he was, I say, I thought it was great yesterday, but we need to see that yeah. more until the, the end of the season. Yeah, I just, I just think when we when it comes to the summer, we'll, we'll not get really into this too much, but when it comes to the summer, we have to add 
players who are going to give competition to these lads because that's the next stage, oh, isn't absolutely. it? With, with somebody, he he needs to be in training every day, competing against somebody who's got like two hundred games under their belt at least. Going bloody hell! I, oh, need you know, better, I need to be better than him every day in training against this team. Like, that's what, and that, yeah. that not just Ekwa, by the way. That's all over the pitch. I, I think that's been chronically lacking this season. Striking options haven't been good enough. You know, Jack Clark has come up with the goods, but the rest of the wingers they haven't. There hasn't been that solid competition in those positions. So, yeah. and, and I think that's one thing that any team needs to have a healthy balance is they need to have competition around the pitch. So. It, you know, it'll come in time, but it's got a feature into the thinking in the summer, and it'll make them better players for it. You know, it will. Well, it's got it, it will, yeah. and I think slightly. I think we can't again go off on tangent, but in terms of the players that we bring, in, we need to bring in a handful of players who are better than what we've got. And I don't think we've actually done that in the past few transfer windows. I think if you look at January, the three players we brought in: Hielder, Styles, and Mundell. Hielder. Hasn't shown anything at all. The show he can make. <laughs> we've had a, a long we've time. had a comment on Twitter from Chris Wiley. He said, "What on earth did Leo Hielder do to get a contract with us?" Bless <laughs> him. <laughs> yeah. You know, Callum Styles signing on loan. If you look at like last season, we had Ahmad on loan. Yeah, brilliant. This season, who have we signed on loan? Styles, Burstow. Burstow. Yeah. Like there you have. They've just filled out the squad. They've, they've took places away from people like Watson and and Barr and other people who. Our players who should be prioritised in, in terms mm-hmm. of getting games and all that sort of stuff, like those two loans haven't improved the size in any fathomable form, have they? So mm-hmm. like we, we need to sign players who are going to be first-team players and then the players who they displace, maybe a little bit younger, have to work hard, have to aspire to get them out of the team. I, I would say we need three or four players like that in the summer who are just going to be nailed on starters. Yeah. We'll round off on the game. I know we've not really talked too much about it, but to be fair, there wasn't like loads to talk about in terms of, of individual moments and stuff. And look, like I say, I think I think if anything, we, we should have took some of our chances, shouldn't we? There was a couple of times where oh, yeah. you maybe saw a nervousness about us, like where we got into good positions. There was one type, uh, Bellingham couldn't get his feet right and, and get passes off. There was one where, I thought Jack Clark was brilliant, by the way, but there was one where he... He was like four on one. They had four players on Clark and he still got through yeah. them. And all he had to do was release Roberts to the right and he didn't. He held on to it, played it yeah, to the left in Bellingham, to Bellingham and it just didn't, it was the wrong decision. There was a couple of times like that where we made the wrong decisions and I think Mike Dodds mentioned their goalkeeper and said he was man of the match. Virtually saying, you know, he's he's got them the point or whatever. But like, I think, I think still whilst, yes, the goalkeeper did well, we should have took some of those chances. That, and that's yeah. maybe just ca- a nervousness carrying over from Monday where it went so badly wrong. I, th- I think there probably was an element of that. I think there was just, uh, and it's you know it's what we've seen all season, I think there's a lack of that goal-scoring instinct as well. You know, there's a few times, especially in the first half, where the ball flashed across the, the six-yard box. And you know, if you had somebody like Phillips in or Defoe there, they slide that in from a yard to, out. To be fair to Bradley Dack, the last couple of games when he's come on, he's got in, he's got in and done that, hasn't he? And he hit the bar. He, he, he hit the bar, hit the bar yeah. in the second half, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think you know, going right back to the start of the game, I actually thought we started off a little bit nervously. And it was Chris Rigg put a great tackle in on somebody in, in sort of our right back spot. And the game changed from that. Yeah. And that, I, I was Rigg, 16 year old. Putting a challenge in like that, spraying the ball out, and the, everything kind of sort of up to a level from that. So I thought he he again really led by example. And, you know, a young lad doing that, superb. You know, we had the Ballard header off the line early on, didn't we? We had um, was Oshisha was was it Oshisha whose header got tipped on the on the bar? Oshisha, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and that was that was unlucky. Clark had a, a couple of shots anyway, kind of cut inside mm-hmm. and keep us saved. Like we we had a lot of chance. Like I, I don't think they could have complained if they, if we were three 0 up at half time. The amount yeah. of possession and chances we had, but you know they they nearly got one just before half time, didn't they? That was Hielder, wasn't it? Hielder yeah. just totally switched off, and then oh, I think was it oh yeah. nine cleared it off the line. It was it was oh nine cleared off the line just just before half time. Yeah, and he celebrated it like a goal as well. Well, it, it, it was. It, yeah, yeah. It, it saved pretty much saved the goal, didn't he? But as I say, in the second half, I just thought we. We played it too safe. I don't think there was lack of effort there. I don't think we turned off like we did on Monday. But I just thought we, we played it safe. We didn't try to play that dangerous pass or that risky pass. We we tried to keep possession. And, you know, I think 
we probably only had one or two chances really in the second half of, of any note, didn't we? Yeah, and, and like I say, it was just one of them where it kind of felt like a either like an end of season game where there's nothing much to be. That's no, it exactly what it was. You know, does it give you any hope going into Leeds? Bear in mind their position in the table. I mean, they look at it. Oh, uh, they've got to win against us, and and I think they will because they're just. I mean, I've watched them a bit recently. I know they lost the last game, but I've watched them a bit recently, and they. I remember. I remember saying this when we played them when Mowbray got sacked, and we, and we managed to beat them. But you look at the players they've got, even on the bench, and you're like, yeah. they're in a different league to to us in terms of what they've got and what they can put out there. Them at Ellen Road, five games before the end of the season, going for automatic promotion. They've got to win because results went against them a little bit this weekend. Well, Ipswich got beaten then, bloody. Look for a while, like Leicester were going to get beat as well. So it's like, you know, Leeds have got to win. They've got to beat us. And I'm worried. <laughs> I think we could get absolutely battered. You know, I actually, I don't know if <laughs> being overly, completely overly optimistic, I wouldn't be surprised if we won. I've I've got <laughs> when I think of Leeds mid, a midweek game at Leeds under the floodlights. I can remember being I was actually in the Leeds end when McAteer scored and we won one nil and I had to I had to poke myself in the eye to try to look upset instead of <laughs> celebrating. I couldn't talk for the whole bloody game. And then there was the, the when Roy Keane had just took over his second game in charge. I think yes, Leeds away. Um, yes, I was at that one. We I, I was at that one as well. We won that one. I'm sure there's another one as well when Mick McCarthy was. In charge, but I, I I kind of tend to feel we do all right at Elland Road in in midweek games. Um, although I do remember we got beat five 0 there in the late eighties, so that um, <laughs> I was, probably puts paid. To that. I was there when Coleman was manager. Uh, that was when we, I, that was we, we, the day, we, we were kind of sort of hanging on. I think I think we might have might have still we could, had. Didn't we? Yeah, we were kind of. Yeah, it was one all. I always remember Donald Love came into the team and he was probably man the match. He was brilliant. I think bloody hell, where's he been? Says it all. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. <laughs> No, but like I, I wouldn't. Yeah, who knows? It's it's been such a a weird season. We, you know, who knows what happens on on Tuesday? But I think it's a good game for us. Where it's a completely different game, isn't it? Where you know we're not expected to break a side down. We're not expected to find solutions to to breaking them down. It's all about how we play against them, how we line up against them, how mm. we stop them. And you know, I'm not sure whether it holds um, too much. It, it, Present, but you know, as you say, when Mowbray had left, and I think it was Dodds' second game in care ch- take a charge last time, I thought that was our best performance of the season at home yeah. to, to Leeds. I thought we were really well organised, played completely differently how we played up to that point in in the season. But we, you know, we, I think we switched the three at the back. We, we did all the right things, stopped them playing, and sprung a few chances for ourselves. So it's a different challenge for us. And I think you know, again, all these players, if if they're looking to you know either get a place for, for us next season or get moves away, it's a great game for them to, to show what they're capable of. Yeah. I think, you know, whether we played Jack Clark the whole game on, on Tuesday, I don't know. It might be a bit much for him, but Jack Clark going back to his old club, he'll be wanting to put on a performance. I suspect, you know, going back right at the start, we're talking about Lise, I, I suspect we left him on the bench against Bristol City because I, we want him to start on, on Tuesday against Leeds. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, good point. So, you know, there's, a, there's going to be a few players who come in and get a chance. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Dak starting for a bit of experience. I actually thought he might have started on Saturday. I thought he could have and probably should have. So we'll, we'll see. But I, I, I think it's quite a good game for us, really. Yeah, I like your optimism, mate. I just feel like I, I just feel like given they, they've just got beat off Coventry and it's a very tense moment in the city. I mean, there's three teams basically going for the top two. And they've got to keep up pace, so they've got to beat us. And I just think you look at the quality in their team, and I just think, oh, this could. Oh, it's going to go. I, do you know what it is? It's going to go one or two ways. <laughs> what you said will happen because there's been some weird results in the championship recently with the teams at the top. Because no, it, it must be it must be a nervous time for them when they when they're at the stage of the season and there's a lot of pressure on your results. So I can understand it, like dropping points to teams where you maybe don't expect to drop points. So that'll either happen. Or we'll get absolutely trounced because we're just not on it. I, I can't see being a nil-nil. Put it that way. No, I don't think so. But if you <laughs> flip it the other way, if we were in Leeds' position, we just gotten beat, and we're playing at home against Leeds. Leeds have a bit of a dodgy season, but they've beaten us at their place earlier in the season. You wouldn't be confident, would you? No. Well, we'll see. I'm just. I'm not. I'm not even going to make any predictions today. I just. Oh, <laughs> I've got an awful feeling about it. 
It'll be nil nil now, won't it? <laughs> well, to be honest, if we do get battered, who cares? You know what I mean? It's, I'm just a bit like Ugh, at the minute with. The, I, I want I want to see. I think you kind of touched on it before. I want to say it's make the most of it when it comes to bringing in players who've been injured, um, getting ready for next season. I guess you know that's what I want to see. I just, but even then, I'm finding it very hard to get enthusiastic about any of the remaining games. It's just a bit nothing this and, and it's been a long long time since we even were in this position which is maybe why I feel so weird and I, I think I touched on it when I spoke to Craig on the last one that I think it's for us as Sunderland fans we're just not used to it yeah but it, we should have had something to play for that's at the pit of my stomach all the time I'm like we should have been we, like there's no reason why this team shouldn't have still been in the playoff mix and that's why I'm like looking at these games and I'm a bit ugh I I would have probably snapped your arm off last season for a season like this, where we were mid table and kind of hanging about. Well, but, it, it's know. a funny one though, isn't it? Because like the points that we had last season, we should have been in this sort of position. Like you look at Norwich, who was sixth at the minute, sixty seven points with five games left in sixth place. We finished yeah. the season on sixty nine points last season. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, they they could and probably will finish the season seventy five. 77, 78 points, which yeah, is, yeah. is a load ahead. Like, 69 points a season will probably finish ninth or 10th. And it's that whole thing. Like, 69 points last season should have got us that mid-table, high high mid-table finish. Or in a regular, like, nine times out of 10, it would have. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, just looking Yeah, Borough finished fourth on 75 last year. And Southampton are currently on 75 and fourth. And yeah. they've got in Southampton. So, they've got seven games left because they've got games in hand. Yeah, you know, exactly. So like last last season was a bit of a one off, really, in terms of how low everything below that top two was yeah. or top three was. And like, yeah, look, we if you're looking even at, at level playing field, like we we should be doing better than we are. Abs- I absolutely, and it's, it's been a completely disappointing season. I think you you look at the the players who are come, starting to come back into the side. And you just see the difference. I know Jack Clark hasn't been out for that long, but he's been out for, what, six weeks or so. You see the difference he makes. You saw the difference Elise makes. And that's not even thinking about Dennis Serkin, who would be in ahead of yeah, yeah. Elise probably at left back. So, like, we've had a number of players who have been out. And, you know, we haven't got the quality in depth to cope with people like Clark or Serkin out for any any sort of prolonged period of time, which we've we've had to do. You throw it in the mix the uh, the poor recruitment in centre midfield and centre forward, and it's kind of no surprise we ended up in this kind of sea of nothingness going yeah. into the last five or six games, isn't it? But you know, there's got to be lessons learned from you know, going on a whole other tangent here about you know the longer term stuff and next season and Kira Louis Dreyfus and Speakman and all that sort of stuff. But like they will be looking at this going, well, we, we didn't get this right this season. We yeah. need to do things differently. We need, we've, you know, I don't think we'll see a, a seismic change in how we approach things, but I think we'll see a change in how we do things, and you know, into whether it's bringing a bit more experience in, bring more depth in, bring more quality in. You know, they've, they obviously have to learn from the the experience with the point and Beal and Sack and Mowbray and all that sort of stuff. So that's a you know a whole other thing that underpins everything when you're looking at not just these games because you know they'll, they'll ideally, hopefully, been having talks with. Some players who the, the want to sign in the summer, or some players will be will know of our interest. You don't want to be going out and losing the last five games of the season. And prospective players going, oh fuck that! I'm not going. I'm not going there. Yeah, it's bloody awful. So like you know, there's <laughs> so many levels where we need to get right over these last five games to set us up for next season. You know, it, it could say if it, if it goes absolutely tits up for the last five games and we lose five, that could be the difference between a prospect a, a manager coming in. Or not coming in, somebody might be looking to go. Oh, I fa- quite fancy going there, and they see a bunch of players down in tools, the crowd unhappy, everything, and they go, oh, "I'm not going to touch that." Yeah. So like, it's so important. Like, you know, we go. We've got nothing to play for. I think there's so much to play for in the last five games, and it's not to play for this season because I, you know, it would t- it would take a absolutely sort of cataclysmic set of results for us to get dragged into the relegation fight. We're not going up. But these next five games are massive, I reckon, for next season on so many levels. So, like, you know, games like Tuesday, at least, massive. If we can go there and put a performance in, and it's not even about winning, it's about putting the performance in, going toe to toe with them, standing up to them, and showing that we're actually up for it. Because if, if we can do that for the next few games, you know, players might you know, come in that are, are 
a to and fro about whether they're going to sign for us. Some players might stay at the team next season. The manager might decide, yeah, I can I can work with that lot. So like, it's, I reckon it's so important, you know. Yeah. And we just got to hope that we see a lot more of what we saw in the first half against Bristol City than we don't ever see what we saw against um, Blackburn again. Because, again, I, I think he did get a response on Saturday. Hmm. And we, we just need to see more of what we saw in the first half for the remaining five games. Absolutely. Well, we've got loads of questions, which I'm not going to get time to go through today, unfortunately. So thanks quick if you fire, did send them fire. in. Come on. Quick oh, fire. Martin, you always put us on the spot. Come on, you know what it is? Let's, let's wait. Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. <laughs> We're drawing this out. Uh, right. Okay. Proper quick fire, though. Uh, old Papa Mowbray. That's, you would think you'd change that name, wouldn't you? Old Papa Mowbray says, is part of the club's policy having inverted wingers? Do you think it would be an idea to swap wingers over at the other side and get some early crosses in occasionally? Yes, I think we've spoke about this a few times, yes, haven't we? Yes, yes. I don't, I don't get why we don't ever do it during games. Like, I'm not saying start with Clark on the right. I'm just saying, like, if it's not working, why wouldn't you want to change it up a little bit? So, yeah, I agree with that. I think we've said that quite a lot recently. Um, yeah, totally. David McCluskey has said, Bar at the match day squad was a strange one for me. Offers much more of a goal threat than the others with the stats to prove it. Also, although he can do a job there filling in, Job is not a number nine. Um, Michael Dunn says we all know the areas that need addressing who would you get rid of in the summer I mean I'd just try and cut the fat a little bit I'd probably let Dak's contract run out Evans I would probably let go uh, given, well, given he he's not he played, played he? yeah, I, he's not he, he wouldn't there. be making Styles' move permanent no. would he he wouldn't be ma- making move for Burstow he'd be looking to loan out Hamia and getting him a season in League One probably Yeah, um, yeah I think there's a few there I think everybody, you know, the start of next season, we've got to have 22 players who could come in and play pretty much a full season. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pembele has not even been anywhere near. I don't know whether they're just saving him because he's had a bad injury or yeah. what, but he might well, be got. He might be one to get rid of. Um, I, I don't think so because he signed a five-year contract, so I reckon mm. they see him longer term. And you, you talk about getting bids in for players like Bellingham. Hume could be one that would get a big bid in for. Yeah. And Pembele could get a chance um, next season, but if he doesn't, he needs to go out and loan because he needs to be playing some football. Yeah, uh, Scott has said, with mid-table mediocrity virtually secured, what should be the strategy between now and the rest of the season? I think we've covered that off, but trying to embrace it would be the very short answer, I think. like Make the most of it, maximise every minute that we've got the players out there on the pitch and get ready for next year. It's got to be, because well, I, you can be very negative about it. Like I'm probably more in the negative mindset because I'm just sick of the season. But yeah. from the club's perspective, they've got to... They've got to get players who've been injured back in. They've got to give minutes to the likes of Chris Rigg. And, and I would like to see maybe Pembele play, yeah. Yeah, get, yeah. get them in. You know, we've got to use the next five games to remove any question marks or remove as many question marks as possible about any of the players in the squad. Yeah. Uh, Joe Lewins has suggested Liam Miller at Preston as a replacement for Jack Clark. Yeah, I, I, he's been linked, hasn't he? Yeah, he, he looks very similar in terms of style of play. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be hard to replace Jack Clark. If there was a player of equal ability out there, he wouldn't be coming to Sunderland because he's. The, this is the problem: is when you do sell really good players, you've got to be thinking about developing somebody else. We aren't a Premier League team where we can go out and spend twenty million pound on a winger who's just as good as him. So no, there's not a chance. You know, and, and uh, Liam Miller at Preston is he's only on loan, I think. Um, and he, he is. Yeah, he, he, I think when we played them earlier in the season at the Stadium of Light, they were shit, but he was the only good player on the pitch for them. He, he looked really good. And like I, I would like to see Watson get a go in the last few games. Yeah. And see like see what he can do. Because he could be one who could be a not a direct replacement, but he could come in and play, you know, fifteen, twenty games next season. But yeah, like you're not going to replace Jack Clark, are you? No. And no. I think we're we're all presuming he's going to go, which looks likely, but you know, he might not. Yeah. Uh, Jimbo has said he can realistically see Hume, Ballard, Neil and Clark all leaving in the summer. Do you think we're capable of replacing this type of quality given we were where we are in the league at the minute? I don't think the league position really matters a great deal. It's more so players that good, like I've just said, are, are difficult to replace. And it's I don't to be fair, I don't think we're gonna go and sell the four best players in the summer. That would be that would be absolutely no. crazy. You Hume's a funny one because I think he it's probably a bit controversial. I'm not sure he's as good as we think he is. I think he's kind of because he flies in tackles and he, he loves getting into those you know, 50-50s, we kind of overlook some of the other bits of his game that maybe aren't as good. Um, I think he's got a ton of, like, and look, this is me saying this, he, he's, what, 21, 22. 
he's developed enormously over the past 18 months. I think he'll develop and continue to develop further. But I don't think he's ready for Premier League football yet. Likewise, Ballard, I think we saw against Newcastle. Both of them really struggled. Um, I think Ballard's looked quite poor, actually, since he came back from from um, injury and suspension. Um, Dan Neal, I, I don't see Dan Neal going into a Premier League club and playing every week next season. Yeah. So I think he'll, I don't see us selling him. I think Jack Clark does go in and play every week in the Premier League club next season. But I I think it, it probably isn't within the plan, as you say, to sell four or five of our top players in the same window. No. Because you can't recover from that. Christopher Bartley has said, where would we be had we signed Ellis Sims? Now, I've, this is funny to me because I've heard a lot of people mention him because he's in good form at the minute. So I, while you were talking there, I've just brought up it's on it's his profile on soccer base and Sims had scored three goals up to the end of January and then got his fifth goal of the season mid February. So that's when he sort of good form started. He scored away at Plymouth. And since then he's went on to score a decent amount of goals. But our fans wouldn't have had patience with him. If if Ellis Sims had scored three or four goals and we paid eight million quid for him by February, there'd have been calling them worse than shite. So it's just ironic to me that people are like, oh, we should have signed Ellis Sims. Well, maybe we should have, but people would have run out of patience. I, I guarantee you they would have run out of patience. Well, you, you're presuming that he does the same for for us as he, he's yeah. done for them, aren't you? Well, I think we, Co- we, Coventry are a, are a really good attacking team, though. No, they yeah. are. Um, I think he, he, they kind of struggled to find a, a system for him to play in early on in the season. I think they were trying to get him and Wright playing together as a yeah, two, yeah. weren't they? Start, but like the the eight million, I think Mark Robinson said it was four million down and four million based on other bits that they achieve. So, you know, if you're looking at four plus four, it's a slightly different proposition than eight million quid straight out, isn't it? But I think having Sims or somebody else, I, I answer the question directly. If we had Ella Sims in the team, we'd be higher up the league than we are now, yeah. because to me, having to send the forward like that changes how you actually play. You've got somebody to play off, you bring other players in. And like we've lacked that all season, haven't we? We've lacked that yeah. body to play up to and vary the play, put crosses in for, and you know, play a long ball thirty yards up, hold, release. Like we've lacked we've lacked that all season. So I think, you know, whether it's Ella Sims or whether it's somebody else, if if we'd brought in a proper centre forward who was capable of playing championship football from the off, like Sims is, we'd be higher up the league than we are now. Jack Gill has said, there's enough rubbish on the pitch already. Pick your shit up and take it home. <laughs> uh, it was bad yesterday, like the amount of it rubbish on the pitch. That's always been a thing that's plagued the stadium, I like, because the wind oh, swirls around in there. Yes, it looks terrible. The when it, there, was a, there was a point where, like, Jack Clark was on the edge of the box and he was just surrounded by litter. Like, you couldn't see the ball, yeah. there was that much of it. And I, I'm, I might be wrong, and people listening can correct us on this, but do you remember Victor Moses slipping on a crisp packet and getting a penalty? He did. Got a penalty? Yeah. Like it's a problem that's pr- plagued us for years. <laughs> it would been funny if it well, happened yeah. yesterday, though. Um, well, I, I was thinking it could be a, another sort of beach ball goal, couldn't it? The yeah. Chris Packett goal. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting. For, it seemed like the type of game that that would happen in. We yeah. Probably would concede it as well. <laughs> but Jack's right. Take your shit home, with you? It's it's bad littering. <laughs> um, right. Cheers, mate. Thanks everybody for listening. We've got a podcast coming up with uh, which we recorded on the night of the international fans party at the fans museum this week. Hopefully. So make sure you catch that also. It's a bit of a departure from listening to us whinge about Sunland. It's nice stories from fans all over the world who've uh, who, who've got some cracking stories about why they're even Sunland fans. I just I loved it. So that'll be a good listen for you all coming up this week. Uh, we might be back after Leeds. We'll see. We'll probably record between Leeds and the weekend. So we'll be back for that one. Uh, cheers, Martin. Thanks, mate. Very good. Cheers, guys. Cheers, listeners. We'll catch you later.